is here, and they're communicating, and you know it's Chinese. You don't know what they're saying to one another, but you know they're, they're talking. Would you make a joke about that? Would you say, oh, that guy must be drunk? Would you say that? No, you'd say, that's pretty cool, wouldn't you? Say an American fellow could talk to a Chinese man in Mandarin and do it comfortably. That's something I'd like to understand. Yeah, that's pretty neat. So you, you know, you have to ask the question, at least I think I need to ask the question this morning, why are these mockers mocking? Now notice also that these mockers, they're not confounded. As the King James translates that word, which means distressed, they're not distressed at all. They're not amazed, they're not marveling, and they're not in doubt. They're not asking any of those questions that the devout men have asked. They're not experiencing any of those emotions that the devout men have experienced. Isn't that interesting? That all of this has happened in the presence of two groups of people, devout and mockers. And the mockers, they seem to know what it is, don't they? Well, they've got it all figured out. And they tell an off-color joke. All oh, these men, they're just full of new wine. seems to me that the mockers ought to be asking the serious question, what does this mean? Instead of telling an off-color joke. And what they, what they say about these folks is that they're full of new wine. These, these men are full of new wine or sweet, sweet wine. Why would that be your very first thought if you're a mocker? Why? Why would it be that they're drunk? Why would, be that, why would that be the very first thing, especially if it's okay to drink? Why would you say, oh, it just must be that they're drunk? <laughs> Isn't that funny? See, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, wine is a... Right, finish that one for me. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say to you this morning that wine not only is a mocker, it makes mockers. To this, to take this sacred event and to make a little snickery joke about it, to take this sacred event when the third person of the triune Godhead fills a house, and fills these 120 people, and they begin to speak with other tongues, to take this sacred event and to exercise your right to mock, to take this sacred event and not even be moved by what's happening, by what they're saying, by the presence of the holy God, to take this event and to say, oh, well, these men, <laughs> they're, just, they're just full of new wine. Oh, they're full of something, all right. But it's not new wine. So devil puts his people in place, the mockers. And what do they come with? They come with a joke about drunkenness. That's all they've got. That's all they've got. Because the wine and the strong drink that they've allowed themselves to participate in up to this point have made them into mockers, have made them into raging idiots, so that when God's presence is nearby, they don't even recognize it. That's how we get temperance on Pentecost. Isn't this sad? So you've got two groups. You've got the devout, who ask a very good question, what does this mean? And you've got the mockers who say, oh, we know what it means. They're drunk. We know what it means. They're drunk. <laughs> There's a bunch of drunks. And of course, the statement that they make, these men are full of new wine, stands in contradiction to the holiness of the event, doesn't it? And, it, and you notice that it say, they say, these, are, these men are full of new wine. Well, there was some filling that happened in the, in the event of Pentecost, wasn't there? Look back up there in chapter 2, verse 2. 
verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So there was a filling on that day, but it wasn't a filling with new wine. It was a filling with something else. It was a filling with the Spirit of God, and it filled a house. So this, this is not something that happened on the inside first. It's something that happened on the outside. The Spirit of God came in and just filled that place up. You know, our house um, down on Mefford Lane, I guess it's just the way it's situated in the end of the cul-de-sac, but we've got a great big, great big window that opens up over the carport. And when we pull that thing all the way open, if it's a windy day and, or if a storm blows up suddenly... You know, we've got a, we can open the windows on the other side of the house and we get this nice little cross breeze. But if it's a stormy day, the wind will come through that big open window and the drapes will just stand straight out like that. And, of course, right there is our dining room table and everything will get blown off the dining room table. And the whole living room and both bedrooms in the back will just be full of air. That must be something what it was like on that day. Just suddenly, like a rushing, just everything just fills up with this air, this wind that blows in. Of course, the wind is symbolic of the Spirit of God. You know, that, that word in Hebrew means both breath, wind, or it means three things, breath, wind, and spirit. So this rushing wind that takes place just fills up the cavity of wherever it was they were sitting. And not only the cavity of where they were sitting, but it fills up the cavity of their heart as well. And there's a rushing now in their hearts. And that rushing leads to something. Peter's going to tell us what that is in just a minute. So this filling happened in the house. And then in verse 4 it says, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So as soon as they're full of the Spirit of God, they begin to tell the great works of God in languages that they'd never studied. So this is miraculous all the way around. And yet the mockers say, oh, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. They're filled with wine. There's nothing. I wish I could find something good in something here for these mockers, but there's nothing. This is ugliness. So what does Peter do? Peter stands up. With the eleven. Notice there in verse uh, 14. Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. And then he answers the mockers first. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is the third hour of the day. So he first of all addresses the mockery. And he says, notice... And I want you to notice here his words, how curt, how short, and how in kind the answer is. Let me, let me tell you something. Don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in answering the mockers. The mockers are always going to mock. Don't get caught up in answering the mockers. They're always going to do that. There's always going to be the devil's crowd. Alcohol is always going to be their primary ingredient. Don't get caught up in answering them and try to debate them and try to be an apologetic for Christ with them. Just do what Peter does. Peter said to them, it's nine in the morning. Do you really think these men are drunk? And then he turns to the devout. So he gives them a very curt, very short, very in-kind answer. He doesn't get caught up in answering foolishness with foolishness. He doesn't answer the fool in his foolishness, and don't you do that either. We spend way too much time, I think, way too much time in the church trying to answer the mockery of the mockers and the scoffers and the debaters of this world. And they all they want to, all they want to mock about and all they want to scoff about is the supremacy of God. And guess what? The supremacy of God is not going to change one bit. Whether they like it or not, whether they mock at it or not, it's not going to change one bit. So why do we even need... To answer them. Just do what Peter does. Just give them a short, curt, in-kind answer and move along. Peter now turns to the, and I'm sure the mockers are like, you know, they're, they're, because they're, you know, they're the proud ones. You know, they're, well, we know what's going on. They're just drunk. And Peter says, no, they're not drunk. And in the back of his mind, he's thinking, dummies. 
It's the third hour of the day. What are you thinking? And then he turns to the devout, and notice what he says to the devout. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember what the devout asked? Look back up there in verse, in verse 12. They said, what meaneth this? Well, Peter is anxious to tell them what this means. And he deals with the mocker, and then he goes back to the devout, and he says, this is that. I love that. Don't you? That's just the, to use the near demonstrative with the far demonstrative in one sentence. How many times do we get to do that? And here's one of those places in the, in the New Testament where that takes place. This, pointing to the Spirit of God coming, is that, the far demonstrative, this is what you know, Joel said. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he's pointing directly to this event. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. So now he's quoting from Joel. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and all my servants and all my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days of my spirit. Oh, thank God. There is a pouring out, but it's not out of a bottle. Thank God there's a pouring out. And it's out of the spirit of God into your heart by faith in Christ Jesus. It has nothing to do with beer or wine or hard liquor. Get rid of that stuff. You don't need it. Why do you even have it in your house? Be done with it. And seek God for more filling. If you want filling, seek Him. There's no fun in the bottle. There's only mockery in the bottle. There's raging in the bottle. There's foolishness in the bottle. Get rid of it. Peter says, here's the filling. He's going to pour out. Oh, yeah, he's going to pour out. He's going to pour out into everybody who trusts Jesus by faith. Oh, friends, Joel got it right. Joel must have seen the day of Pentecost. He must have heard the words of the mockers when they said, oh, these men are just full of new wine. Joel said, yeah, the Lord's going to pour out all right. He's going to pour out on sons and daughters. He's going to pour out on maidens and young men. He's going to pour out on old men. (laughs) I decided that. When I got the news a year ago that I was going to be a grandfather, that I was officially an old guy now. Yeah. And I I embraced it last week when we went to take family photos. And the very first thing that the photographer says was, she said, Grandpa? And she looked at me. And I said, yeah, I'm I'm the old guy now. Grandpa, come and sit here. So Grandpa went and sat down, and then they put that baby in my lap. I said, yes, I am a Grandpa. Glad to be one. But I decided when I was told that I was going to be a grandfather that I was officially an old man, and I opened up to the book of Joel, and I turned to this passage where it says, your old men shall dream dreams. And I said, Father, if it so pleases you, give me dreams, dreams generated by the Spirit of God. Let me dream more. Let me dream big. And I began to pray this prayer because the Spirit of God pours out and he pours out on old men and old men dream dreams. Let that happen to me. See, this is what he promises for us. Prophecy, dreams, visions. Oh, friends, there is so much more in the pouring out of the Spirit of God than there is in the world's version. And then notice verse 17. He repeats it. He says in in verse 17, Um, I'm sorry, in verse 18, he repeats it. He says in 17, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And then notice in 17, or in 18, he says, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. So twice, Joel uses the I will pour out statement here. This qualifies, ladies and gentlemen, as a sign in the earth. And so these devout men on the day of Pentecost, they see this and they're confounded, they're amazed, and they marvel. And they're in doubt and they ask the question, what does this mean? And Peter says, here's what it means. This is the sign. And what does the sign point to? Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the sign points to. I'll never forget when I was in Jerusalem, they had, uh, they had big signs up. And, of course, all the sign, signage was in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. 
and there was, there was one road that we always traveled down to go home.